anniversary of Roe versus Wade, President Barack Obama released a statement that read in part, quote, because this is a country where everyone deserves the same freedom and opportunities to fulfill their dreams, end quote. His statement fails to apply to the 57 million, that's 57 million unborn babies who were aborted or murdered, or to the women who have diminished in the United States since 1973. They never had a chance to live their lives or fulfill their opportunities and dreams. Roe v. Wade used raw judicial power to overturn the democratically passed laws in every state in the country and remove state restrictions on abortion. Hence, America has become one of the leading abortion nations, a place where one in four babies are aborted. And we stand with only four other nations, including China, North Korea, that allow for full late-term abortions under any circumstance. Our nation's laws need to realign with the changing views of Americans on abortion. In a recent national poll, 84% of Americans support significant abortion restrictions. Nearly 6 in 10 of those who identify as strongly pro-choice. For example, 79% of pro-choice respondents believe that there should be a 24-hour waiting period before having an abortion, and 80% support parental notifications. Americans are waking up to the tragedy of abortions. In the Gallup poll, Americans are at a record low, while 50% of Americans identify themselves as pro-life. And the next generation is strongly pro-life, as they have become increasingly aware of abortions, including women suffering from short-term and long-term physical and psychological problems as well as the atrocities associated with the destruction of human life. Extreme liberals should be even more concerned about how life-affirming medical clinics are now revolutionizing women's medical care and providing a true choice for women. They share countless stories of women facing unexpected pregnancies who have scheduled an abortion and yet changed their minds when they found the support and resources. Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider in the world head-on. Planned Parenthood receives $540 million from taxpayers. As the national poll shows, a shift is occurring and more Americans are embracing the pro-life message. Should not the federal government provide equal funding to support clinics that provide women with access to abortion alternatives? 92% of all women who use Planned Parenthood services get an abortion, and for every 145 abortions performed, Planned Parenthood only makes one adoption referral. Women deserve better and more options. Every woman should have access to quality health care and compassionate abortion alternatives. Can a movement really consider itself pro-choice when it only allows one choice? Women de- For those who promote adoption, Lord, hear our prayer. For national and local pro-life groups. Lord, hear our prayer. For unity in the pro-life movement. Lord, hear our prayers. For courage and perseverance in pro-life work. Lord, hear our prayers. For those who suffer ridicule and rejection for their stand for life. Lord, hear our prayers. For those imprisoned for defending life. Lord, hear our prayers. For those who have been injured and mistreated for defending life. 
Lord, hear our prayer. For legal professionals. Lord, hear our prayer. For courts and judges. Lord, hear our prayer. For police officers. Lord, hear our prayer. For educators. Lord, hear our prayer. For media professionals. Lord, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for the baby saved from abortion. Lord, hear our prayers. And thanksgiving for the mother saved and healed from abortion. Lord, hear our prayers. And thanksgiving for the former abortion providers who have become pro-life. Lord, hear our prayers. And thanksgiving for all those who take a stand against abortion. Lord, hear our prayers. And thanksgiving for the call to be part of the pro-life movement. Lord, hear our prayers. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Graciously hear us, O Lord. O Lord, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you have created all things through your Son, Jesus Christ. He trampled the power of death by his paschal mystery. May all who acknowledge you promote the sacredness of life and always serve you faithfully through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hey, we have Roger Stanwyck joining us. He's a motivational pro-life speaker, a writer for 15 years. He's the past president of Crossroads Ministry, New Life Pregnancy Center in Gaylord, Michigan. He's involved with the Right to Life of Michigan and Gaylord. He's the former deacon and pro-life minister in Gaylord Evangelical Free Church in Gaylord, Michigan. And currently, he's a deacon and pro-life minister in Benzie Area Church of Christ in Frankfort, Michigan. Thanks, Roger. Bring this up here. I got kind of dry pipes this morning. You guys are scaring me. I usually only speak to my own reflection. <laughs> well, said if you don't know where to start, start at the beginning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start about 40 years ago at Mom's Big Oak Table beside the doors to her yard. Mom had gone to the kitchen to get coffee and out in the yard the sunlight trickled down through the trees and across her gardens and I remember my thoughts drifting to all the years that I played in that yard as a child. See, my mother was excited because she wanted so much to have grandchildren at a younger age. She wanted to be young enough to really enjoy them. She wanted to have energy to play and to take them places. And she was excited that her firstborn son would give her her first grandchild. I told you you were scaring me. <laughs> no, she couldn't resist suggesting names, though. She would say, boy or girl makes no difference. But the names were always girls' names. <laughs> they kind of led to cute nicknames. Mom called me from the kitchen. How's my grandchild doing? Well, I didn't know what to say. I had never thought about what I would say. Surely people would notice the difference. It just never occurred to me that I would have to tell anyone anything. And this is Mom. What do I tell Mom? What's wrong, she asked. Has something happened? Is everything OK? You look pale. Something must be wrong. Something was wrong. I had taken part in a murder. If I didn't commit the murder myself, I'd hired someone to do it. And as I confess this to you, I can tell you that there's not one court in this whole nation that can touch me. Not one cop, not one prosecutor, no one can touch me. I can give names, times, places, it won't matter. The hitman was a physician, and the person I hired him to kill was my mother's first grandchild, and I can't be touched because killing unborn children is not a crime. 
I was assured it was a good decision. An abortion is just a procedure that removes a blob of tissue, not recognizable as anything at all, certainly not a baby. It's not a baby until it's born. And why go through the inconvenience of a full-term pregnancy just to give it away when you no longer have to? Besides, you're a guy. So what's your problem? Relax. It's not a big deal. Starting to do it. Abortion is a man's issue, too. Most women blame their need for abortion on men who are unwilling to take responsibility for the child they fathered. And why would we? Think about it. Why would we? Abortion gives us what we've always wanted. No accountability. No obligations. No responsibility. No consequences for our actions. The reality is, abortion liberates us, not women. Men are empowered, not women. The acceptance of abortion as birth control has freed us from all but the few hundred bucks needed to solve the problem. Abortion gives men sexual freedom. What it gives women is a terrifying experience that lasts a lifetime. Still, the abortion side says, that's okay. None of that matters. It's a woman's right to control her body. Of course it is. I couldn't agree more. But I submit that one does not control one's own body by destroying the body of another. The time for any of us, both men and women, to control our bodies is before sexual relations, not after. Not after when we're trying to justify killing a baby so that we don't have to be accountable for our actions and be responsible to a child. But when you get married and there are children involved, people want an accounting of whose are whose. When I was asked if I had children, I'd reply, no, God never blessed me with children of my own, but of course he did a blessing refused in an abortion clinic. Now a child's life begins at its conception. No rational argument can be presented otherwise. There's a living male, living sperm, living female, living eggs. When the living sperm and the living egg get together, they create a living one-cell human being, which becomes a living you or me. The instant that one-cell child was created, I became a father. And it doesn't matter how long my child lived or how it died, I am a father. I will always be a father. A father who murdered his child. But the past is the past, right? Get over it. Try to get over it. For me, the choice of abortion was wrong. But I couldn't stop it. So when the day came, I supported her, becoming an accomplice to my baby's death, hoping that over time, I would get over it. But I never did, and I never told anyone. I kept it to myself. And I remember how I dreaded to visit my friends' newborns. It took all my resolve just to hold one, and how I hated having to say that I was happy for them, but all I wanted was to get out of there. And I know that family and friends wondered why I was so uncomfortable around their babies and why I expressed no desire for children of my own. And then I had children, stepchildren. <clears throat> I want to tell you that God has blessed me with wonderful stepchildren who call me dad. And now I'm also blessed with their children, who call me Papa, give me bear hugs, and say, I love you. God's been kind to me. With these children, he softened my heart, and he allowed me joy I would have missed altogether, and he was also preparing me for a wake-up call. When my wife was away, 
And the kids were upstairs fast asleep. I learned how abortions are done. From start to finish. Step by step. And I wish I didn't know. I don't know how to describe the reality of abortion sinking in. That my baby suffered, died in agony, arms and legs ripped away. I tried to find the words. I can't. I just wish I didn't know. And then for a long time after, I just sat in the dark, staring into space, wondering, a boy or a girl? And I wept. It makes me smile that I say wept. I didn't weep. I cried. I cried in heaving sobs of anguish, of grief, of guilt, regret. I cried until I could hardly breathe. See, abortion is a man's issue because we have the abortion too. No, we don't have it physically, but we have it. We have the loss. We have the regret, the sorrow, the guilt, not in the same way as women, but we have it. No matter what our age, our religious beliefs, our education, our marital status, when or where or why, our hearts ache. Mine did. And I made the mistake that most of us do. I was silent. Still after that night, I was silent, not confiding in anyone. My heartache grew worse. But I still didn't talk about it. And then one day, I told God what he already knew. And forgiveness washed over me like a gentle rain. And I want to tell you that all of us who have made this terrible mistake can have the forgiveness we need and be set free through Jesus Christ. 25% of us have been affected in some way by abortion. That means every fourth person you come in contact with throughout your day. And I always wonder about the crowd I'm speaking to. You're dedicated to the unborn, but have some of you neglected yourselves? Do you have your own abortion past, your own secret, like I did? Maybe it's not your own. Maybe it's a family member or a close friend that you need to forgive. Does that weigh you down day after day like it did me? Do you want that weight lifted? The leper approached Jesus and said, you can heal me if you choose. And Jesus replied, I do choose. Forgiveness is his gift. Just waiting for you right now if you want it. Do I still have regret? Sure I do. I live every day with the consequences and things happen that trigger my memories as they do in everyone's lives. But Jesus didn't promise to change my past. He promised to change my future. And here's the good news. God is real. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. Heaven is a real place. That's where my baby is. Alive and happy. And you know what? They all are. Mine, yours, theirs, they're all there, every one of them. For Jesus said, let the little ones come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And one day, we'll get to meet them. Forty-two years ago, on January 22, 1973, the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton decisions superseded all state laws prohibiting abortion, making it legal to kill unborn children through all nine months of pregnancy. Manipulated and heavily pressured 
to equate unwanted pregnancy with gender discrimination, the court set into motion the ultimate act of discrimination, abortion. Instead of applying motherhood, it made mother and child adversaries, creating an endless cycle of pain, death, selfishness, deceit, and a lifetime of guilt and regret for millions. Because of these two decisions, our families, our communities, our state, our nation will never be the same. Almost 60 million children have lost their lives. They have died horribly and painfully, their tiny bodies going out with the trash to the dumpster and the landfill. And now, now the other side proposes that a mother be allowed to have her child killed for a period of time after its birth, just in case she changes her mind. Who will stop this? Who can stop it? There must be one organization, one group, strong enough, influential enough, one group that has so much power and influence its demand to stop abortion can't be ignored. Men, we're that one group. We are the one group that cannot be ignored. We are the one group that can demand abortion be stopped. Abortion's our issue. We are 100% accountable for babies. No child can be conceived without a willing man. We are responsible for each and every one, yet we allow them to be slaughtered in our nation by the thousands each day. Edmund Burke said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Nothing is pretty close to what we've been doing. We need to do more. We need to end abortion. We need to embrace the politically incorrect roles of being outspoken men of integrity and responsibility and in abortion. We need to become the pro-life leaders in our homes, our churches, our communities, and in our nation and in abortion. We need to be the moral examples our sons and daughters will follow because they have learned from us that they have the responsibility to be accountable for their actions and to protect the sanctity of all human life from beginning until end. Men all around you, your buddies, your co-workers, your neighbors, your family, and even in your churches, they don't know the truth about abortion and they won't until you tell them. And it's not hard. All you have to do is bring it up in conversation. That's all you have to do. And when you make them uncomfortable, you're doing a good job. That's what you want, to make them face abortion for what it really is. And you'll have to be able to defend yourself, because you'll be challenged. And the other side is well entrenched, but their position is weak, supported only with half-truth, lies, and deceit. And someone will tell you, that you have no right to speak because you're a man. Well, I hope you'll agree that it's not only your right to speak, that it's your obligation as a moral man of integrity and responsibility. God bless the women who have been on the front line since the beginning, but men, they can't do it alone. Ladies and gentlemen, Every child who dies at the hands of an abortionist has a mother and a father who die a death of their own that very day. Today we're here because, among other things, we're mourning the loss of these innocent lives, and we're mourning for the moms and the dads, hurt by the choices that they made. And to reach out to this community, the state, in this nation, that people will awaken and reject this barbaric practice of abortion. Meanwhile, there is good news. We're not that far away. The abortion industry is collapsing. Operation Rescue reports 73 abortion clinics shut down last year, with the total number remaining nationally 739. That's down from over 2,000 20 years ago. We have applause for that. That's not good. Well, there's still a lot to be done. 
Planned Parenthood's latest report shows that for them, an increase of abortions provided, reaching about 94% of the services that is provided. And across the nation, federal courts continue to block abortion reform initiatives from being implemented, but we can't lose sight of our goal. We will get there, because we are winning. I'm often told at an event like this, I'm preaching to the choir. Not much good will come out of it. It's kind of a waste of time. But I disagree because it's the choir that does all the singing. But their point is that once the service is over, the choir quits singing. We can't quit singing. We got to hit the street singing. And we got to keep singing. And we've got to get as many other people to join in as possible and help them change their fear of speaking out into fear of what is happening because they don't speak out. 3,000 children a day need to be saved, and there's no one else to save them. It was my hope that one day each of us will see Jesus face to face. going to back up. My brain's ahead of my mouth. Jesus said that whatever we do for one of his brothers, even the least of them, we do for him. And it is my hope that one day each of us will see Jesus face to face, and he will say to us, when you rescued the unborn, you rescued me. Thank you. represents one child lost to abortion here in Manistee County uh, in 2013, which is the uh, most recent statistics that we have.
Pregnancy Care Center here in the Community House. And just overwhelmed at seeing the candles there and knowing how many of our children who would be in our community have been awarded. Um, the past year has been a whirlwind, I would say, um, with our center moving from our location on Parkdale Avenue to a new location at the corner of Maple and Third Street. Um, I'm not sure if God would have told me what he had planned on for me when I came back to the center, if I would have taken that task on again. But I somehow I know that I would because it was he, but it is through his calling. Um, since we've moved to the new location, we have been seeing a flurry of younger girls who are coming in to the pregnancy center. We have girls as young as 14, 13, and 14 and a half year olds. Um, the good thing is they are choosing to parent their their children. Um, Working with them is very difficult. They don't have the maturity to understand a lot of the things. However, they are working with their parents and some um, child advocates that are working with them as well. Day to day, it's, you never know what will be going on at the Lighthouse Pregnancy Care Center. There is many things that go on as far as our counseling, the girls who come in who are searching, you know that they are only not only searching for help as far as diapers and wipes and that, but they are looking for something more in depth. They're looking for something more spiritual. They, and a lot of them don't even know it. They know that there's something lacking in their life. There's know that there's something else there and that they can come to the pregnancy center and they can receive the help that they need. This past year, um, we had a, a woman who came in who was abortion minded. She had an appointment for abortion three times, but she kept coming back. She kept coming back and she kept coming back. And each time she would leave, she'd make an appointment. Then she would come back and she would leave and she would make another appointment. In the end, I'm happy to say that she did um, make that choice to parent her little baby. And every time that little baby comes through our doors, it's just so wonderful to hold him, to cuddle him, and to know that his mom made a choice for his life. And I don't, I don't really believe that that mother truly knows what that choice has made for that child. I don't think she truly understands the impact that that has on that little baby. And for us at the center, we know what that impact is. We know how great and you know, the plans that God has for this little one. And with some of the great stories of the, the miracles where the women and girls have chosen to make the choice for parenting, we do have some tr women who have made the choices to abort. And it's a very, it's very hard for us who work there to know that these mothers are making that choice. And when we do whatever we can, we give them the facts, we give them the truth, we show them in scripture, we support them spiritually to help them grow. But in the end, some do make that choice. It's a heavy day, it's heavy weeks afterwards but we know that that mom, not only has she brought an end to her child's life, but in many ways, there's so many things within her that she's ending as well. And she's creating the guilt and the shame that she has within her. And it's going to be a lifetime of heartache for her. We are there for her afterwards, too. We're there with our, um, our Bible study, Forgiven and Set Free, to open up our arms and our hearts to them 
to help them heal from the effects of the abortion. The other things that we have right now, we are looking at our makeover program and the philosophy behind that is helping women, helping young girls from 7th to 12th grade to understand who they are in God, the beauty that they have, the, the, how God has made them, and how through his creation, that's all that's really necessary. That they don't need to have this outward beauty, that they are beautiful in Christ. And one of the reasons for that program is so that we can touch them and teach them before they come through our doors with an unwanted, plant, unwanted pregnancy in their eyes, but an unplanned pregnancy in their life. So we're working hard. We thank this community for your support. For almost 11 years, Lighthouse Pregnancy Care Center has been in existence. And it has only been through the support of this community, your financial support, your material support for diapers, wipes, and clothes. And you know, sometimes it's, it's almost unheard of for a business to last three to five years, but for a nonprofit to exist for over 10 years and be sustained totally by the community, that speaks volumes at the community really knowing how essential the work is that Lighthouse Community Care Center does. And what I really want you to know is how Lighthouse Pregnancy Care Center is your ministry. You support us. You give us. You build us up. You pray for us. And with that, I want to thank you. So I want you to know that you belong. You are the Lighthouse Pregnancy Care Center. And again, just thank you for your support. You have, you have just given up you know, beyond anything that I could ever imagine. The work there is, is hard on a day-to-day -day basis, basis. So one of the biggest and the most important things that you can do is to pray for us. Our doors are open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Please be in prayer for us. When we're sitting across a young girl or a woman who is contemplating an abortion, it's very, it's difficult. It's difficult, and all we can do is open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to speak through us and to give us wisdom and to give us the knowledge that we need to minister to those women. Thank you. Thank you, Myra. Again, it's a great service, and we appreciate your efforts as the director there. It is a difficult job that you have embraced. Um, for those of you that are able, there is a collection bottle, um, literally bottle, baby bottle in the back on the table. And we are uh, accepting collections. They will all go to the pregnancy center. Um, if you write a check, please make it out to Lighthouse uh, PCC. That would be great. And again, the back of the table, when um, time permits. Okay, now the Oregon chapter, one of their chapters for Right to Life, created a video that we're about to watch. And so if you need to change your chair, if you need to scoot over, Colleen, you can go ahead and turn that on. Would it help if I move the flowers? Okay, if the candles are there, can you all see the screen? And it's a very good depiction of what 57 million is. It's a visual on, sometimes we hear how many abortions have been and we get, it's hard to put a number. This is a depiction of what that would be.
Very sober and graphic. Is that all? Okay. Uh, again, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we had originally planned on doing a, a march down to River Street intersection, but I think with the icy sidewalks, we're not going to walk down there. Pat had suggested that maybe some people might still want to get in their cars and drive down there. We do have signs in the uh, available on the back table. I'm going to let you guys make that decision. We do have refreshments uh, afterwards if you wanted to go out and stand and come back or if that was decided against that then we have refreshments right now and really it's up to you guys what you would prefer. Um, but I think I, I, I don't recommend the, the walk down just because at least half the sidewalks have not been plowed or shoveled or cleared, and I think it's pretty wet and slippery for a, a walk. I don't really recommend walking the highway. So, does anybody have a preference? What parking lot? Uh, Pat, what was your suggestion? Is there enough area to park? Has it been plowed? We usually park on the street or <coughs> yeah, right there. In, yeah, there's right other there. areas around there. Right there. Yeah, there's a laundromat there. I'm wondering if uh, those that wanted to go for about a half an hour, yeah, then we could come back here at eight. I mean, if anybody wants to stay here and have 
your dessert, that's fine too. Maybe we can have a show on hands who would like to go. Who would like to go out and stand for a little while? Yeah. I just think that it shows yeah. we're you bet. alive and well. So, but a, but a drive, a drive down by yeah, so we'll walk. Just yeah. drive down. Okay. And, and then the parish hall will stay open, and Pardon? snack. And the, this hall will stay open. Yeah. And, and the ones that don't I would, would prefer to stay here, that's fine. Yeah. They can just just don't eat all the food. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. So I guess driving down to uh, across from the House of Flavors. And Why don't we uh, kind of gather? And, uh, I can take three people. Oh, there you go. We can yeah, share. I can yeah. take five. Okay. So, Again, thank you for coming. I wanted to walk. <laughs> well, I didn't want to stand. Yeah. Take a shot. Could we walk? 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no ice. You mean drive down there and then walk? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Just but if we walk. get more people on the highway, yeah. there's not yeah, a whole lot of people down True. River Street. Well, we could go down well you don't have to stand a half hour even if you're there. Yeah, you could walk minutes. back and forth. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking to stay warm. Yeah. I just want to hear the Kathy mentioned she would like to walk. I wonder if there was anybody else that would like to walk. Um, one plus Concerned about us losing a whole lot of revenue there. I'm concerned that the machine breaks down. If that happens, and we're, and we're doing everything we can to get it fixed as ex expeditiously as possible. But it's really not going to impact the revenues materially at the boat launch, and that should be fixed prior to the prime season. Um, it's been working very well. It's in a harsh environment down there, and so you have to expect some sand's going to get in and cause some failures. But in general, at the boat launch, I think the biggest the